Okay, so let, let me let me begin by by welcoming all all of the the people now, and first of all, of course, we thank our uh, speaker, this is Johannes Stern from the University of, of Bristol. Johannes is um, a researcher uh, at the University of Bristol. Indeed, he is, a princi is the principal investigator of an ERC project de devoted uh, to uh, to truth, uh, and I, I don't know exactly now the, the title, truth and semantics, yes. So he, he's, he's holding the starting grant under an ERC, uh, anti-ERC. Uh, he had in, in the past he had positions as a Marie Curie Fellows at Bristol, and then in Munich he worked for 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 a while at MCMP. So the MCMP is a mathematical center uh, for no uh, philosophical center for mathematical philosophy, as far as I remember. He wrote his. Um, PhD thesis at the University of Genève uh, under the supervision of uh, Fa Fabrice uh, Correa. His, super his uh, thesis was published, was published in uh, the series Trends in Logic uh, under the, the title Toward Predicate Approaches to Mo Modality. Indeed, uh, we, we can say that um, Johannes is a specialist in this direction. That is how how to handle model uh, operators, not as operators but as predicates. Yeah. Um, then he uh, he has done several work in in, uh, in important uh, directions of philosophical logic. He published in the Journal of Philosophical Logic, the Review of Symbolic Logic, and other philosophy journals. Uh, he also wrote uh, interesting a, a couple of, of papers, so to speak, in the philosophy of mind, uh, concerning uh, the the issue of the so-called Penrose arguments, uh, as as you probably know, know, say, Gödel's theorem have been used, uh, and, and then later uh, he the arguments has also been <coughs> uh, refreshed by Penrose uh, holding uh, a position, an anti-mechanistic -mechan position in the philosophy of mind. By the way, uh, we are very, very interesting, interested in, in listening to his talk. His talk has the following title, Truth and Subjunctive Theories of Knowledge. No luck, this is the question. <laughs> so the, the title is, uh, a puzzling, and uh, so uh, please, uh, Agnes, go on, and we will yeah. be here listening to your talk. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, it's a great um, honor to give a talk in, well, in Firenze, um, yeah, um, where obviously there are um, renowned specialists like Andrea um, Cantini or Ricardo Bruni on theories of truth, and um, my talk falls squarely into this kind of <laughs> the so as um, Andrea mentioned, um, I've worked a lot on the application of the use of truth in um, to modal notions, um, also, but the application to um, the use of truth in modal semantics, and to some extent, this um, this talk um, is another variant of, of this theme, although the focus is somewhat different. Um, so what is the, the what is this talk about? Um, so Kripke's theory of truth is a theory um, for con constructing interpreted, um, sorry, um, attractive interpretation of the truth predicate over monotone semantics or over monotone evaluation schemes. Um, now, Subjunctive theories of knowledge, I'll explain that more in a bit, will um, give rise to non-monotone evaluation schemes. Um, so it seems, so the standard strategy for applying Kripke's theory of truth, so this kind of um, theory of truth um, to such semantics seems to fail. 
So, but we might still wonder whether even though the way Kripke's theory has been developed and presented, it is applied to monotone semantics, maybe we can nonetheless um, find so-called Kripke and fixed points for um, um, semantics that incorporate some junctive theories um, of knowledge. I'll say a little bit more about all these different um, um, notions, um, but yeah, for now, so that's kind of the general, um, the question I'll, I'll tackle, um, I'll investigate. So yeah, the structure of the talk will be then as follows. So I'll first kind of give a bit more background to what I'm doing here. Um, then I'm going to um, present the semantics for truth and safe belief. And then I'll, I'll show how to construct fixed points um, over um, for Kripke's theories of truth or for a Kripkean truth operator um, over that semantics. <clears throat> so yeah, let's start with uh, giving a bit more background. So Kripke's theory of truth is typically, so typically we have a non-classical semantics, um, non-classical logic in the background. And then um, we, we find interpretation for the truth predicate such that um, for every sentence phi, um, phi is, is, um, is satisfied in the model if and only if phi is true um, um, is satisfied in the model. So where, yeah, the important bit is finding these interpretations S. And that will only work if we, as I mentioned, if we um, work with a, um, or I'll say, qualify that claim a little bit um, later on the talk, hopefully. But this will only work if we work with non-classical satisfaction um, schemes. Um, for otherwise, we have sentences like the liar, which are true if and only if they are not true, and we ha um, derive a classical contradiction. So. <clears throat> And in typically, if we work with these non-classical monotone semantics, we can find fixed points and we can find a minimal fixed point. We can find maximal fixed points um, given a suitable background logic, and we can find so-called intrinsic fixed points and so on. Yeah, so the crucial um, um, <clears throat> feature is, as I mentioned a couple of times now, is the monotonicity which is basically that a gain of information or by making more sentences true, we don't make other sentences false. We don't lose information. And this is typically what is, the, what is incorporated by these non-classical semantics. And this monotonicity, um, or this then also leads us to a more cryptic theory is basically an application of the theory of positive, positive um, inductive definition. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of the, the background um, on Kripke's theory. But yeah, so the goal is always to find um, interpretations such that um, phi is satisfied in the model um, if and only if phi is true is satisfied in the model. Um, now, as I mentioned, the, the, um, this apparatus works, we can always find these kind of interpretation over um, monotone semantics. Um, um, but <clears throat> then there are good, there are a lot of, or not a lot, but a good number of non-monotone phenomena in language, logic, and philosophy. I mean, uh, and examples are conditionals. Typically, we um, conditionals are um, give rise to non-monotonicity. Similarly, generalized quantifies or restricted quantification. If we say something um, like, <clears throat> um, I don't know, most uh, logicians are Italians or of the like, similar um, um, exact truth maker semantics and variants thereof, which um, kind of feature aspects of semantics or kind of semantics that are kind of quite popular now are typically non-monotone, but also, um, subjunctive theories of knowledge, okay? So what, what about um, Kripke's theory of truth in these contexts? Can we find fixed word? How, how should we, um, how, yeah, how can we find good interpretation of the truth predicate? And in a way, so I'll here focus um, on subjunctive theories of knowledge, but in a way it's kind of the start, um, I'm interested 
in general, also in the fr in the framework of my project, in all sorts of these um, non-monotone phenomena, how one can incorporate a um, interesting notion of truth in um, over these semantics. Okay, so let's say a little bit about subjunctive theories of knowledge. So the subjunctive theories of knowledge were introduced um, in order to um, block Gettier style counterexamples to um, the understanding of knowledge as, as justified true belief. Um, so, and they were meant to rule out knowledge by mere luck. Um, just briefly, so the idea was one can be justified um, uh, in believing some, in, in, in having a belief, and this belief turns out true um, without um, knowing um, uh, the given proposition, um, because what justifies um, the my belief is not what, what accounts for the truth of the proposition. And in this case, it needs, seems to be a mere accident that we have justified true belief. And um, subjunctive theories of knowledge um, are um, the idea behind them is to, to kind of block knowledge by mere luck. Okay, what are modal, modal conditions of um, knowledge? Um, they are, um, <clears throat> there are typically three different kinds that are discussed. So the first one is the so-called sensitivity, um, which says that in all closest non phi worlds, so in the, in the similar, in the most, in the worlds which are, um, in which non phi holds, but which are as similar to our world as possible, the, uh, the agent would not believe phi. So that's the sensitivity condition on belief. The adherence condition is in the closest phi worlds, so on the um, most similar worlds in which phi is the case, the agent um, <laughs> believes phi. And now, um, and that's the one we'll focus on, or I'll focus on in the talk, in the closest world in which um, an agent believes phi, so the most similar world to ours where an agent believes phi, um, phi is true. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of the idea behind subjunctive theories of knowledge. Um, and here I'm gonna focus on, on um, the safety. So um, a semantics for belief, where we also have the safety condition. Um, so we have a notion of safe belief, or if you accept the, the um, justified true belief or um, account plus safety as a definition of knowledge, then it, as it were, um, we are looking for dexastic semantics where we also have a knowledge operator. Um, and yeah, so what I'm saying is kind of independent whether you think that subjunctive theories of knowledge are good theories of knowledge. I mean, safe, the notion of safe belief is interesting in its own right, and it's discussed to um, some extent in the literature and used in the literature. For example, in also in Williamson's, um, um, <clears throat> um, what's the title? Well, the seminal book um, on knowledge, um, which is an, a knowledge first um, approach to, yeah. So not a reduction of um, knowledge in um, or in terms to some sort of belief. Okay, so now, <clears throat> A little aside, um, because it's maybe a bit interesting. So the um, modal conditions, um, these modal conditions I just introduced were um, originally introduced to the literature using um, subjunctive conditionals, um, or perhaps it's more popular to call, maybe one can call them also counterfactuals. Um, so where you'd say like if, so sensitivity would be, if non-phi were the case, then um, um, the agent would not believe, believe phi if adherence would be, if phi were the case, then the agent would believe phi. And if the agent were to believe phi, then mm -hmm. phi is the case. Um, however, there's a little, there's an issue with that is that safety and adherence um, condition require non-standard semantics for conditionals. Um, which is that one can one needs to assume weak centering as opposed to strong centering. Strong centering means that um, no world is as similar to to the world itself, whilst weak centering um, only means that um, um, 
no world is more similar to 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 let's say or for every world for the actual for every world w no world is as similar um to w as w itself so that might make one wary so then this is a non weak centering is a non-standard um assumption and that might make one wary of using the conditional um what there's a now in the context of um truth theories there's another reason um which um to be kind of wary of that it is that um i don't know if i have time to that to that but as i'll il illustrate uh, more um one cannot find fixed points for truth plus uh um, subjunctive conditional but one can find fixed points for um truth plus safe belief or any of these modal conditions um, spelled out with, in, um, without a um, conditional. Okay, so this is kind of um, the background on truth and, um, and theories, uh, subjunctive theories of knowledge. And now I've introduced the semantics um, for truth and safe belief. Okay. Um, so just the language. Um, so we work in a language which is L sub K, which extends the, the language L by a truth predicate. So importantly, this language contains a suitable syntax theory, which could, for example, be the arithmetic and arithmetical language, but um, like PA, but it could also be kind of a, a proper syntax theory in terms where we talk about um, ex expressions, their concatenations, and their substitutions explicit, um, directly rather than via coding. Um, yeah, the language contains a truth predicate, a belief operator, um, and so K is a knowledge or a safe belief operator, and we have um, contingent predicates. Um, I don't explain. So in terms, we might have individual constants um, in there, but yeah, as well. So um, Okay, and also potentially function symbols, but um, preferably then only of the syntax theory. Okay, so then nothing um, um, surprising with the language. Um, then let's introduce the basic um, notion of the semantics, which is that of an ordering frame. So an ordering frame consists of a, a set of possible worlds and doxastic accessibility relation an ordering relation that that is induced by a possible world, so it's a it's a partial um, ordering um, relative to every um, um, possible world, or that we get a partial ordering relation relative to every possible world. Um, oops, sorry. So, and um, yeah, finally, so big up w's um sub small w or denotes the set of all the worlds that are um um so to say in the ordering in the sphere of of um w okay so what does it mean so that they are that um they are um compared to, if we look for a similar, they're similar to W in some respects, okay? That's um, um, big W, small, sub, small, um, with subscript small W. Um, and yeah, finally, as I mentioned, um, so we all assume weakly cent weak centering, which means that for all um, W, a small W and big W, um, um, no world um, or, <clears throat> All worlds are at most as similar to W as W itself. Okay. Um, yeah, so one remark. So here in terms of doxastic accessibility relation, so I um, assume that this relation then is right unbounded or serial. Okay, so every world will see another world. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the ordering frame. Um, and oh, ordering frames, you can um, build belief models um, and by adding an interpretation um, function. And this interpretation function, but will only um, provide an interpretation of the vo vocabulary um, of L that is, or with a, of the vocabulary, except for the truth predicate. Okay. 
So and importantly, the interpretation function E will um, provide a constant interpretation of the um, vocabulary from the syntax language. So it's in the, say the syntax um, language is rigid in a way. So it always provides the same interpretation from world to world. And also the interpretation function um, assigns the intended um, expression of the language um, um, with the truth predicate, for that matter, to the terms of the, um, uh, yeah, so assigns the intended interpretation of the names of the LK, of these expressions of the language. Um, yeah, it, it provides, so if you have a, sent a name of a sentence phi, then the interpretation of that um, of that name will be phi, the sentence itself. Or, I mean, if we work in an arithmetical um, setting, um, then the the Gödel number of that sentence. And it's, um, I mean, I allow the base models to be um, um, non-classical. So in that sense, an interpretation, every contingent predicate will receive an extension and an um, anti-extension. Um, but where for the syn predicates of the syntax language, um, this will be classical, okay? So this, this non-classicality only affects the, the fragment of the language which is not part of the syntax theory. And then we get a belief model out of that, um, a frame and a, a plus an interpretation of the belief model. And that kind of gives us an interpretation for the language without the truth predicate. So now, what do we do with a truth predicate? Well, um, for that, we add an evaluation function, which assigns, um, so this is relatively standard, which has a method, or like this framework is relatively standard. It has been, for example, discussed um, work by Volker Halbach and Philip Welsh, um, but also, for example, in, in some of the, the um, work um, Andrea Cantini mentioned um, of myself, but okay. So an evaluation function is a function that assigns to each possible world in the frame, a subset of the domain. And this is so to say the interpretation of the truth predicate at each world. Okay, so the interpretation function F delivers um, the interpretation of the truth predicate at each world. Okay, and while sub F is the set of all evaluation functions relative to a frame. Okay, and we can define the notion of truth in the model. I'm not gonna go through the whole um, setup, but it's basically a partial, um, partial, um, um, so the strong cleaning notion of truth in the model. That means it's kind of a positive inductive definition. Um, I'll just go through the modal um, clauses here. So the uh, formula of the form of psi, belief psi is true if and only if um, for all, if psi is true in all doxastically accessible world, all worlds that are doxastically accessible from W and um, it's false if there's a world um, that is doxastically accessible from, from W in which it is false. So now, now let's look at the safe belief. So safe belief, so the first condition it needs to be believed, okay? And the format's okay, psi or psi is safe believed um, is true if it is believed and there is no closer world where um, psi is believed and psi is, not um, psi is not the case in that world. And it's not safely believed if either if it's not believed or if it's believed, but the this the upper condition um, um, fails, that is, there is a world, um, <coughs> there is a closer world in the world. In the there is a close world in which psi is believed, but psi um, is not the case. So immediately one can see that there are um, non-positive occurrences of the um, satisfaction relation in three and four, which will be responsible for the semantics being non-monotone. Right, um, just so what is I, typically one constructs now the interpretation, if one in, for monotone semantics, one constructs the interpretation of the truth predicate by um, um, 
iterate by applying the so-called um, uh, jump operation to it, which is one starts with a evaluation function um, um, and collects the sentences that are true given that um, evaluation um, function. And by repeating this process and starting with a suitable evaluation function, one eventually reaches a fixed point, a set where the k of f, so k, the Kripke jump applied to evaluation function f, um, yields f itself. Um, yeah, so the so just saying, so the k jump or the Kripke jump for um, collects the sentences that are true um, under the given um, evaluation function, um, and it does so parallel in each world. So that's just kind of um, doing what one would do in the non-modal case, but now um, jointly at all possible worlds. And we can define an ordering on this um, now um, by simply so. Uh, uh, evaluation function f is smaller than g if for all w the um, interpretation uh, or the f w is a subset of g w. So the interpretation of f, of the truth predicate at w is always under the evaluation function f is always a subset of the interpretation of the um, of the evaluation function g w. Okay, and then it's not hard to see that this or it's this um, jump operation is not monotone. Um, so I have an example here. I don't know how clear. So just um, it's not the best picture, but roughly. So don't misinterpret interpret the. So the labels on the left are of the of the path are not label for the path. So the path or the doxastic accessibility relation, and then you have the ordering relation given. But here the idea is we have a. Um, to evaluation function, so and and the sentence how, which is a truth teller, which um, we can put in um, at free will. So notice that on a W um, for both under F and under G, um, we believe um, um, tau is believed. So the truth teller is believed at W. Um, but now <clears throat> because because uh, so in Z is um, uh, a world that is as close to W as W itself, and we need to check whether our belief here is safe. That is, that whenever we believe, um, if we believe um, something in such a closed world, in this case Z, then it needs to be um, um, it needs to be the case. So in the first case, so um, in F. We don't believe tau because tau is not true at y. However, and hence the safety condition is uh, trivially satisfying. In the second case, um, we do believe, so under G, we do believe um, um, tau in Z. However, um, tau is not true at, at Z, so the um, safety condition um, um, is, does not hold. So that means even though that um, G is, so to say, greater than F, according to our ordering, um, the Kripke jump, um, so if we apply the, the Kripke jump to, to F and G, so this K of G is not greater um, or equal to F. Okay. So this is a counterexample to the monotonicity of the jump operation. So what does that mean? So it means that the Nasser Tarski arguments for the um, existence of fixed point are not applicable. Um, so we also don't have a don't have an argument, so to speak, for the fact that the application of this k operator over the minimal evaluation function, that is the evaluation function that assigns the empty set to every possible world. Um, so we have no argument that this um, may lead to an increasing sequence of interpretations for T. And that's ultimately um, uh, how, um, what if one knows one has an increasing sequence of in, um, interpretations over, um, over the empty set, one can also kind of infer to the existence of a fixed point. Okay. So but the second point, so we have not shown that this is not possible. 
Um, but we just don't have a standard argument why I'm in synchronicity for that. So one might wonder, can we find do, do iterative applications of k to g lead to an increasing sequence relative to every belief model? Well, the answer is no. I'm not going to talk through the through the um, example, but basically it's a variant on the previous example. Okay, so we know that it does that this jump operator does not always lead to increasing sequences of interpretation of the minimal evaluation functions. And now we can say so. We don't have a fixed point result by monotonicity. We don't have get one more increasing sequences over interpretation starting from the minimal evaluation function. And one might seriously wonder whether there are fixed points at all. However, um, one, if one look at this example, um, maybe going backward. So if we look at this example, so this was the iteration over the empty set, it turns out that um, even though we don't have a strictly, um, in, we don't have an increasing sequence over the empty set. Um, so we, this sentence sigma, which was, which we here show that, so it was in the interpretation of the truth predicate after one application of the jump operation, but no longer after the second one. Um, however, we can see that from then on, it remains stably outside the interpretation of the 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 um, yeah of the truth predicate. So sigma will remain untrue for all alpha greater than two. And as a matter of fact, it seems like this observation generalizes so that, that for all um, um, cases where when we iterate the um, um, iteratively by the k jump over the uh, minimal evaluation function, um, even though certain things go from true to untrue, um, there's always a point at which point, from which on they kind of have their semantic value in a stable way. So one might wonder whether all sentences settle or stabilize on some semantic value from some ordinal onwards. And if so, one could hope to find fixed points for a quasi-inductive definition or for quasi-inductive definitions. And that's ultimately what I'll now gonna, um, what the rest of the talk will be about, kind of showing that if we look at a quasi-inductive definition, um, or we can find a uh, um, fixed point for such a quasi-inductive definition. I'll say a little bit more. So what will the strategy amount to? So first, I'm going to um, give determine general properties of evaluation functions, so a um, function that assign interpretation of the truth predicate or give the interpretation of the truth predicate. So I'll, I'll determine general properties for these evaluation functions such that all sentences um, will eventually stabilize in the construction process. That is, by, iter by repeatedly applying this um, Kripke jump or this K operation to the very evaluation function. And these um, evaluation functions that have these, uh, this property will be called, pre called prefix points. And then we can argue that prefix point, the, that, yeah, if you consecutively apply k to a prefix point, we reach a fixed point. And the second point will then be to step in the construction will be to show that such evaluation function exists. And in particular, I mean, the, what, what I'll show, although um, I will not go through the argument here, is that the minimal evaluation function um, is a prefix point. Um, and then putting these two together, we know that um, k has fixed points. So um, let's um, define the iterated application of this jump operation. Um, which is, um, yeah, so the first, so zero is obviously the interpretation um, function itself. Um, at limit, uh, at successor ordinals, we just collect the one that are, that um, have been true at the previous stage. And then for the limit ordinal, we use the so-called limit um, rule, which is if at a um, ordinal smaller than the limit ordinal, um, if, um, there exists an ordinal smaller than the limit ordinal from which point onwards, um, or, um, sorry, that, that is a, 
sorry, that, that is not um, the right way stated. So it should always be. Um, so what I'm saying here is if there exists, so it's a set of those sentences phi um, such that there is um, an ordinal smaller than the limit ordinal from which point onwards phi is stably um, or phi is in k gamma f for all gamma greater beta smaller alpha. So um, yeah, so it's the standard lin min fruit. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is the contrast. The contrast to let's say the theory of inductive definition is that we don't just take the union over all pre um, um, previous stages. Um, just mentioned we could use other limit rules. It doesn't really matter for the purposes here. Um, but yeah, so we'll end up with quasi-inductive definitions rather than positive inductive ones. Um, yeah. And now the, the what I'll do now is kind of I'll determine give a definition of the stabilizing ordinal of a sentence um, relative to an evaluation function f. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of the stabilizing ordinal is that's the point from which on um, in the construction the sentence will have a stable um, semantic value. Um, yeah, so and uh, yeah, so so in roughly what we're tracking there is the maximum is the embeddings of the truth predicate over a, over. A, certain sentences that are all over the sentences that are deemed true um, or false um, according to to the base model we're working with or the the model for the language without the belief model we are working with and the um, evaluation function we are given um, and so basically and that's also what's going to be so so to, to give this um, definition of a stable ordinal, ordinal we first kind of introduce this notion of Base. So again, that's the sentences that are true, so to say, at the outset, which is um, consists of the um, um, the um, evaluation function, the so to say, the kind of complement to speak. So this would be something. So f w is the extension. F minus w is here is the anti extension, and then all um, sentences of So that's kind of the base basis of our definition. And then we can push it. Um, then we can kind of assign a stabilizing ordinal in the following way. So if a sentence is from out of from the basis, um, it's it's at a world, it's zero. Um, it, the, the stabilizing ordinal goes up by one for if we uh, um, by the if, if it's a formula of the form true t or non-true T. Um, yeah, so that's what you can read. I just realized, so it should be I W comma T is Psi. Okay. Um, right. <clears throat> and then we kind of, um, then nothing changes. So obviously for, um, for the safe, for a safe belief, the the stabilizing ordinal is a supremum for um, of psi and not psi of the stabilizing ordinal of psi and not um, and not psi, um, and for conjunction also we take the supremum. Um, yeah, that's all, and obviously for the for the quantifier, and um, so not. In this case, not all sentences will be assigned um, stabilizing um, ordinals. So some stabilizing ordinals, uh, some sentences will not receive a stabilizing ordinal. Okay. And uh, relative to world, so that was the stabilizing ordinal of um, um, relative to f at a world. But then we take stabilizing ordinal of phi relative to f to be the supremum. Of all um, the stabilizing ordinals relative to to a world for that sentence, and rho f is typically a or is typically a partial function. Yeah, and as I mentioned, it it this rho f phi can be thought of as the maximum number of embeddings of the truth predicate in phi over some sentence psi in the basis. 
And um, so the the stabilizing ordinal or the cardinality of the um, stabilizing ordinal is typically bounded by the language we're working it, and indeed we can find a supremum of all these um, stabilizing ordinals um, um, of all the evaluation functions of a frame in all sentences. And that's going to be here the psi f. Um, and that's a frame supremum of f. OK, so now we can, I, can, I can give um, fix, um, conditions um, under which iterative applications of um, the K um, operation to evaluation function will lead to fixed points. And um, evaluation functions that satisfies these conditions will be called prefix points. And what are, they, what are these prefix points? Well, these are, pre these are on the one hand, um, they are such that if um, the phi does not have a stabilizing ordinal relative to f, um, then phi will not enter the interpretation um, of the truth predicate at any world for any um, ordinal. Okay, so they will always remain outside. On the other hand, if um, the stabilizing ordinal um, of phi is alpha, um, then um, for all from from that ordinal uh, um, onwards, or from the next ordinal onwards, phi will remain in the interpretation of the truth predicate or it will remain outside. So if, if it's in the interpretation at that ordinal, it will remain inside the interpretation. If it's not in the interpretation at that ordinal, it will remain outside. Okay. And then it's relatively straightforward to see so that if um, something is a prefix point, um, then the, so the psi f times applications of this um, jump operation, 2f is the fixed point of k. Why? Because then all sentences that could, um, that stabilize have been stabilized, have stabilized by then. And well, um, for the others, they remain outside anyway. So k applied to k um, psi um, at ordinal psi of um, applied to f is just k psi um, applied to f. So this kind of completes step one of the construction. Um, so <clears throat> we have determined general properties um, of evaluation function for which all sentences um, will eventually stabilize. So it remains second bit. Well, that is just um, a very, is, this, there is no kind of, at least I didn't see a nice and easy way um, um, around um, for doing that other than proving it the hard way. So one can show, so what what show now is that um, prefix is non-empty um, and then we know that fixed points exist. So um, and in particular, the function, the minimal evaluation functions, that is the function that assigns an empty set to um, every possible world as the interpretation of the truth predicate is in a prefix point. So and that's just a rather um, strenuous, um, or one just needs to verify these properties that G has these properties via some rather by rather tedious transfinite inductions. So, but yeah, we know that this this tells us that K um, psi of F G is a fixed point of K. Okay. So yeah, so there are fixed points. Now, maybe surprisingly, this fixed point of the, the, the k psi f over g is not the minimal fixed point um, of, of this operation. So there are, in general, so at least um, maybe for specific phrase, but not, there are, in general, no minimal, there is no minimal fixed point, neither is there a maximal fixed point. Um, but so this is kind of the negative observations. On the other hand, if we look as a Kripke fixed point for the language with a truth predicate but without a safe belief operator. And all of these, um, all these fixed points are prefix points of, of K. So we can kind of have the, again, I mean, uncountably many um, fixed points. Um, we can also have fixed points where we have, from fixed points where you have some doxastic self reference. 
So if we have uh, the sentence, um, it's a safely, uh, so K um, T um, Yota, where Yota um, is basically um, the name of the sentence itself. Um, and then we can find for arbitrary frames F and worlds W a fixed point such that K T of Yota is um, in that is in the interpretation of the truth predicate at that world. So I think, yeah, I think I'll stop here. I'm just mentioned quickly two things. So one is that the construction I'm giving here can be kind of seen as a um, general version of the Gupta's construction in where he shows that, um, that we can find um, a classical model of truth when we, if we work with, um, if we work with um, here, with un so expressively or with specific quotation names, which are somewhat structurally um, impoverished. Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing to mention, and yeah, so. Another thing to mention is, before I go through the summary, is that so I constructed the fixed points now from the bottom up over, let's say, the empty set, and then I built them up. But one can, um, as in Kripke's case, one can um, turn this whole thing upside down and, and kind of sieve out um, certain sentences and thereby construct um, a fixed point um, over um, starting from, so to say, the maximal evaluation function, um, <clears throat> which assigns the set of all sentences as the interpretation of the truth predicate at all possible worlds. Um, yeah. So to sum up, so this this jump operation in um, was non-monotone, and there it could not be um, also not a fixed point could also not be constructed by iterating or by obtaining. Uh, an increasing sequence of interpretation um, of the truth predicate. Um, but nonetheless, in the semantics, we can find fixed points for, for um, we can find for fixed points or fixed points for safe belief. Um, but there are no minimal or maximal fixed points. Um, but yeah, as a warning, um, one shouldn't formulate safety using the subjunctive conditional um, because then they, there won't be any fixed point. I mean, I have some slides on that, but I think it's better um, to stop now. Um, yeah, so in a, that's the reference. So in a way, the moral, um, in some cases it's possible um, to find fixed points. Um, even if we're working in non-monotone semantics, but this is, of course, a highly special case. Okay, thank you. Very good. <clears throat> yeah, it's a lot. I haven't found yet the smoothest way to, to, to present it in a very intuitive way, um, but yeah, I hope something, I got across something. Okay. So, Ricardo, are you going to be yes. the chairman? I thought you would. I, I ah, you want I second. Second. So, okay. So, uh, many thanks to uh, Johannes for this nice talk. Indeed, not not easy to 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 understand. I mean, it's very, very compressed. So, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's 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 very nice. I mean, mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, I simply now would like to open the discussion. So if, if there are questions, curiosity, or uh, problems, so please uh, raise your hand or simply enter the discussion in some sense. Just uh, well, I, I'll open the. The discussion myself, so to speak. <clears throat> what is uh, that, that? Does it make sense to ask or to investigate the structure of prefixed points? What is the structure of all these 
the fixed points. So we have shown how to certain cases how you can get to some uh, fixed point uh, using this technique of quasi-inductive definitions. Right? Well, to fixed points or prefix points? Both. I mean. Both. Yeah. So um, the thing is, so for fixed points, I'm not sure. So I, I toyed around. I at the beginning, I naively thought that my the the fixed point I construct over the empty set will be the minimal fixed point. Um, but that was very naive as it quickly turned out because it's if one goes back to um, so in a way um, one can always so let me maybe go back to the example like the the frame something like that so if one looks as a maybe the frame is better if one looks at a case um like let's say like this one but where we so where we look at the two sweat teller but mm -hmm. other in not um but we have instead of the truth teller we have a disjunction yeah. of um some sentence or some some contingent predicate or like um sentence without the truth predicate and the truth teller which such that um, the, the, this contingent predicate is true at W and V, okay? But, um, <clears throat> but false at Z and Y, okay? So at Y, this contingent predicate is true. So it's basically the contingent predicate has the, um, as the one, the the just the truth distribution, um, like in F. Here, the the you can see on the slides, right? The the mm -hmm. um, here. Anyway, so if that's for the contingent predicate and the truth teller um, um, is true at y. Um, so what I'm saying, so if we then have a look at evaluation function where the truth teller is true at y. Then the the it will not it will it will um, not be the case that um, that you safely believe let's say P T let's say be the contingent predicate or tau or the truth teller, but in the minimal evaluation function you do that. <laughs> what that means is for for basically we can find um, like doing this trick with truth tellers. Um, uncountable many um, fixed points which are incomparable in terms of minimality. So, so at least it may doesn't. So, so the starting then whether we can find an algebraic structure over this um, kind of uncountable many, um, not immediate. It's obviously not, you cannot just put them together and find a new fixed point. So because, yeah. So joining them. Will will not is not guaranteed to, to give you yell the new fixed point so on so if so, I mean I haven't found a neat algebraic structure and it's I also haven't found a good way of investigating them other than really making these hard computation by an induction transfinite inductions whether yeah. actually these are then prefix point or fixed points so I was very much hoping to find kind of neater algebraic kind of um, um, characterization, but so far without any avail. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, uh, other questions or comments, please? If there is no one else asking questions, I would like to make uh, a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. uh, just, a, just a couple of questions. Uh, they might be naive because I I, I'm not familiar with the original setting, so I'm sorry about that. But I mean, you you didn't mention, although it's something that one can deduce from what even from what you have just said about the complexity of the fixed point structure mm -hmm. and the absence of uh, an, an algebraically investigable uh, structure of the fixed point. So I'm not saying that there is none. Just I. No, no, I mean, yeah. Yeah, but you mentioned that you have infinitely many fixed point that you cannot compare. So this suggests that there might be a high complication in the whole construction. And that's what typically happens with quasi-inductive definitions, because I mean, they allow you to expand the possibility 
of getting fixed points in situations where normal uh, strategies would fail. But mm -hmm. this has a cost, and usually you pay, the, you pay the price in terms of complexity. So you didn't mention, for instance, the complexity of the ordinal that allows you to, to get a fixed point from the prefix one, but I assume that it must be a high, uh, highly complex ordinal. Uh, uh, I don't know yet. I mean, I have to talk with Philip a little bit soon. Uh, <laughs> but um, so yeah, I mean, so in terms of complexity, I don't, I don't really know much. I mean, I know obviously that um, for my, for the one, um, for the one I construct over the minimal evaluation function, that's kind of bounded at least by the complexities of the. Um, nil sequence um, of the Herzberger construction. So, I mean, that that's not much information, but... <laughs> yeah, no. So, so no, I mean, obviously, I can show that, that it's easy to see that it's at least, I mean, I've obviously, it's super easy to see that the construction, that I get something that is pi 1, 1 hard. I don't yet know, I haven't checked whether whether it is actually um, sigma 1, 1 hard. So that's kind of an interest. So I think, on the other hand, it's not excluded that this construction over the minimal evaluation function um, does not lead to the to a pi one one set after all, because in a way it's it's very kind of yeah I don't know I don't think it's um, ruled out from the get go, but yes I mean the the complexity over the whole of the whole um, yeah lattice of fixed point well, yeah might be very different. And, Okay, so the, the, here comes the, my observation, which was a, about axiomatization. I don't know right. if there was an issue about that at the, with the original theory, but I, I suspect that this construction of yours, uh, I mean, doesn't help in terms of finding an axiomatic uh, theory that's expected. Not, yeah, I'm not sure. The fixed point property mm -hmm. is delta one one. Ah, okay. So because I only, I mean, look, it's an arithmetic formula. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's it, basically, it's the, the, if you look at the satisfaction condition. So here, yeah. there is no second order quantifier in there. So we know that if something has a fixed point here, e independently of positive or not, that's a delta 1, 1 formula, ultimately. So the fixed mm -hmm. point property is delta 1, 1. So, okay. So that and that, if you depends what you understand by axiomatization. But if you think about something like n categoricity, which we, we discussed with Falker at some point, or like say that the that over a certain model, you can you can um, characterize the fixed points via the axiomatization. That's not ruled out, I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You have to activate the, the microphone, Andrea. Oh, sorry, sorry, yes, yes. So <clears throat> additional remarks or questions, comments and so on. Uh, yeah, please also ask if you have any clarification question. I know that this was um, a lot and, or maybe. So also the students, of course, you may raise your hand and just question Johannes Stern about his uh, contribution. I mean, I, I like, I, I now comment, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like the, the, the point that um, <clears throat> as you finished in, in your abstract, despite the no, monosoni, no monotonicity of the semantics, um, you can uh, successfully apply uh, Kripke's theory also in, in, in this uh, subjunctive theories of knowledge. Mm -hmm. of course. So this is a, uh, sure, for sure a, a, a new a novel point, at least uh, for, for me. Um, so large, let's stay on, on the philosophical side. Yeah. From the philosophical side, what, what do you think uh, this uh, sort of analysis and results are useful for. I mean, do you have, uh, say, in, in the background some philosophical uh, idea 
or conclusions or intuitions that he, one might uh, convey to the reader of, of a, a hard piece of logic, so to speak, uh, that follows from your work. Yeah, I don't not like that. But what I think, what I what I understand it to what I understand to be doing there is more giving a framework in which um, debates in epistemology or in the theory of knowledge can be spelled out now. I mean, before the, the notion of truth is prevalent in a lot of debates um, in epistemology and the theory of knowledge, yet um, very little, um, I mean, us so often, um, or there was no framework in which these, um, these arguments could have actually been successfully formalized, or perhaps there was, but then though, then either by by using kind of a more or less typed or or kind of a, a setting where you don't allow for the formulation of these self-referential sentences or um, in the same way. Um, yeah, so I think it's more of a server. So for for or it's more kind of providing a framework for um, contemporary um, um, debates and epistemology. So that's that was more my thought behind it, and ultimately. I'm also kind of was a bit interested in finding out, um, looking a bit at strategies for finding, for determining fixed points for these um, non-monotone semantics and kind of the ins and outs. I mean, so how far can one, for what kind of semantics can one even hope to find fixed point or, or which is it kind of um, hopeless or what strategies can one explore um, to this effect for the giving and providing fixed point results. So that's kind of my, so I don't, don't have a deep philosophical insight, I think, to convey here, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, what I didn't discuss, so um, that much I mentioned it in the, so what it, what, what might be one moral, so though I would um, only draw very tentatively is one should really kind of not move away from from giving these modal conditions in terms of um, conditionals um, because one gets oneself into a lot of trouble for which there is no need in which one doesn't in which one yeah trouble one needs to get involved with um, I mean so the one is yeah we can't have a, a truth predicate uh, like a Kripkin truth predicate over that anymore over the semantics anymore if we have a conditional um, but then there were independent motivations for not doing that anyway. So all this together, I think, suggests let's not not use conditionals and okay. formulating them. Okay. So uh, comments, remarks. Well, if if not, let let me make an additional question. Uh, I always. Uh, think that quasi-inductive definitions are somewhat uh, uh, intriguing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, say fr from a technical point of view, say from a mathematical point of view, you, you uh, use uh, originals in, in a very essential way, mm -hmm. I, I think. So one might think, uh, well, my question, uh, this is a question, uh, maybe once uh, I talked with uh, Philip uh, for, mm -hmm. about this point. Uh, is there a an ordinal free, an ordinal free way of producing some typical results in, in the say in, in the theory of quasi-inductive definitions? So I I wonder whether the, there is some different approach, not not uh, typically set theoretical and based on ordinals. So yes, when you yeah. use ordinals. Uh, as um, as in set theory, as in classical set theory, you are just using classical logic straight on, right? So mm -hmm. one might uh, approximate the, the, this uh, this problem just making some experiment. How far can you go in uh, carrying out all the constructions that, that you have sketched, not only in, in this approach to this specific question of subjunctive uh, uh, theories, uh, but also in, in general to, to quasi-inductive definition in a constructive set theoretic uh, uh, framework. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if I was 
uh, was uh, ra rather clear, but or uh, enough I mean, clear. So the idea is so um, I basically I quantify over uh, a huge initial seg segment of the ordinals uh, to the very least, yeah. and to what extent can I do that? I mean rather than assuming that outright kind of um, have a constructive kind of um, yeah yeah I don't think I yeah I don't think I can provide any insightful answer to that um, um, yeah I mean no, I mean if you want to deal with all this stuff also with, with this paper of, of yours you start uh, doing all these uh, recursive definitions, yeah. transfinite recursion, recursion uh, de definition by transfinite recursion, right? So one might figure out w whether there is some purely, so to speak, lattice theoretic or purely um, set theoretic or uh, algebraic approach to, to all this stuff. You see yeah, that? I would really much like that. In a way, I was. Um... I was. Anyway, it's, I think it's a problem. It it, it was there. It, it is. It is worth investigating. It. Mm -hmm. Is there? Has there been any work in that direction? I I don't know. I I have a, a vague remembrance of, of a, a, a talk by Peter Axel, but many many years ago, where he he uh, talked uh, about quasi inductive definition. Um, but uh, where, where he used a, a, a set theoretic framework. He started with certain families, we, we had certain closure properties, uh, and then did some work in that direction. But, but then he, uh, it was a hint because I, I never saw uh, um, this idea developed mm -hmm. and I never found uh, other hints in these directions. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not so, so, so easy. I don't know, just... Yeah, no, just... no, I do agree. It would be super interesting. Mm -hmm. And I kind of... Um, so it's not that I, I... I Actually, at the beginning, I was hoping to to find some... some providing um, a fixed-point result via some certain algebraic consideration. But I just uh -huh. couldn't couldn't get anything going. Um, and it's I haven't given up yet, but I... Um, yeah, it's just... Um, I, I'm not there. Let's put it like that. Maybe it, I, mean, okay. I will keep looking into that direction. Um, if, if, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So again, uh, other, other uh, comments, uh, ideas also from the students or, uh, for, for the young people uh, attending the, this lecture, uh, in any case, uh, your presentation has been very, very, very clear, and it's. Uh, I think it's quite appropriate if you send your your PDF to to Ricardo, and we put all this uh, work uh, available to to our students. So, yeah. So the the slides are already sent. Um, so I don't have a page. Okay. To okay. 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 Um, yeah. Is there any any work of yours already published in these directions? No, but I I hope to finish a draft by the end of this or next week. Okay, okay. So, uh, Ricardo, well, how do we proceed? Uh, as long as there are no more comments or remarks, we may uh, thank again Johannes oh. for. for the very interesting talk, as you said. Okay. And uh, well, yes, we we regret not, not to meet you. We regret yeah. not to meet you in person and uh, and uh, sit uh, sit together about uh, with, with with a beer or with with a glass of wine, uh, uh, as was usual after logic uh, uh, seminar in Florence. It's really a, a, a pity, right? But it is a a generalized situation. Yes, so exactly. It is not Probably our, our problem. Visit each having other. Not, having not done it yet will okay. give us the occasion to properly invite you, hopefully next year, for an, an, another yes, seminar yes. here in Florence. Oh, of course, of course, yes. It would be nice. Oh, um, ap apart from uh, Philip, Philip is still working, right? Yes. Uh, still active, I mean. Yeah. Apart from Philip, uh, um, 
Kentaro is also in Bristol or? Not at, no, not at the moment, unfortunately. I mean, no, have, I don't know whether you are aware of what happened mm -hmm. to Kentaro. Yes, I, 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 I'm aware. I was informed by, by, by Volker about all yeah. the documents. I also wrote some later. But, he is in Japan yeah. at the moment. And okay, he, okay. At the moment, he doesn't have an academic job. I see, I see. And uh, maybe you have met an Italian student in, in Bristol. Yes, I mean, of France. course. Of course, I mean, I, um, Simona is now my PhD student who was. Oh, okay, so, <laughs> um, so very, very good, very, very good. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy that he, he can interact with you. Yeah, so, yeah. Great. Yeah. if there are no additional comments, questions, and so on, we thank you, we, we warm, warmly, warmly thank you, we heartily thank you for the nice talk. And uh, we hope to meet you in person yeah. <laughs> some other times. Okay. okay. And of course, I. Uh, ciao. Francesca, volevi dire qualcosa? Francesca. Okay. I was just going to say thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, bye bye. Bye bye to, to everybody and uh, see you next time. So, bye bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you very much. I'll ciao. see you.